Only a couple days elapsed before B found someone who wanted to explore the passage with us. B told me he talked to a few other people who couldn't make it because of scheduling conflicts. He said they really grilled him for information about the cave and about the passage. He would not tell them which cave it was to ensure that we explored it to our satisfaction before he made it known to the public. Even the guy who ended up going with us did not know which cave until we were very close to it. And he was sworn to secrecy that he would not reveal the location of the cave to anyone on the planet. I won't identify him by name, so I will just refer to him as Joe. Joe, B, and I set out early in the morning to make sure we could spend all the time we wanted in the new passage. When we got to the cave, we were able to rig up and descend rather quickly. It helps when you don't have to haul half a hardware store down to the cave. Joe was impressed by our work. Even B and I took a minute to pat ourselves in the way, you know, on the, on the back for all the hard work we had put in. And for the fact that we made it through. And Joe is a rather thin caver who has had a lot of experience in caves. He said this might be the tightest squeeze he had been in. But it didn't bother him. I knew that physically he would be able to make it since I was bigger than him and I made it. He was just as excited as us to get through and get caving, maybe more. He quickly got ready and was waiting to hear what the plan of attack was going to be. I figured I'd send him through first since he was ready, and I'd follow. B would pass our gear through and wait for us outside the passage. B would give us two hours to return. That was nice of B to go down to the cave and babysit us. It gets boring sitting there in the cave. With our plan set, we were ready to roll. It was perhaps irresponsible of us to not tell Joe about all the unexplained events that occurred in the cave until after he had gone through. But what exactly do you tell someone? How many of the weird things did we have to reveal to him? We did not feel that we were in any danger, so we did not go into the cave ourselves. So we did not tell him a thing prior to him entering Floyd's tomb. Of course, when we did tell him afterwards, it was... too late. I couldn't believe how easy Joe slipped through the passage. He said it was tight, but it sure didn't look like it. Once he got in, we passed him his gear, and then I started him. Even though I knew that I could fit through, it was still a slow trip through the tomb. You could only go so fast when you're scooting with your toes. When I reached a tight spot of the squeeze, I had Joe snap a pic of me. I thought it would make a good photo once I got through. B started to relay my stuff to me. Then disaster struck. I'd gone all the way and turned around to pull my gear through. I had to kneel down and crouch down slow. I had just got my helmet, ironically, and light was just... You know, light was turning around to feed the rope back to B when I smacked my head on top of the passage. Human skull versus solid rock. Rock one. I told B what had happened, so he had sent my first aid kit through. I was bleeding, but even worse, I didn't feel too good. I patched myself up, and then Joe... I didn't think I'd, I'd, I'd better continue. <laughs> I told him that. He looked like a little kid who was told that Christmas would be cancelled. Although I didn't like the idea of him exploring the cave without me for selfish reasons, of course... I wanted him to at least see part of the cave for making the trip out there. I told him how far to go and how long it would take. Then I sent him on his way. As I laid there, I could hear him crawling into the darkness. His light disappeared after the first turn. I rested a minute or two, then began my journey back through the squeeze. I was disappointed to get all the way to the cave and then not be able to explore it to its end. Actually, it's killing me. After I got through Floyd's tomb, which was painful, I sat down and munched on a cliff bar while B and I chatted. I told him I would pay for a motel room if he would stay overnight. Then, we could see how I was doing the next day and make another attempt at the cave. I felt goofy for having smacked my head on a cave wall. B said he was willing to give it another try tomorrow. He was just as anxious to put some closure to this cave. As long as Joe would stay overnight as well. We determined to wrap things up the next day. Once this was settled, we just sat back and enjoyed the darkness. We could hear no sounds coming from the passage. The sounds reminded me of the scraping noise that I had heard last time we were out there. I brought up the subject with B. Since I had not explored the cave completely, I could not offer any explanation of what could be making the scraping noise, or the change in wind strength, or the rumbling, or the terrible scream that we had heard. Suddenly, we both wished we had not sent Joe into the cave alone. B went to the hole and yelled into it, Joe! No answer. Not surprising, you, you just can't hear each other when you are very far apart in a cave. We nervously awaited any sound, good sounds that is, you know, Joe type sounds. The 20 minute time limit that we had set passed, then 25 minutes. I really had no desire to climb back through the squeeze, my head was still throbbing and the squeeze looked tighter than ever. Still I knew that I was going to have to make sure Joe was safe. Just as I was getting prepared to go back through, I saw a light deep in the passage. Joe? I called out. Nothing. Joe? Still no answer. The light got brighter and I could hear the noise of someone crawling ar across the broken rock that lined the cave. You okay, Joe? No, was his weak reply. 
When he got to the other side of the tomb, he said that he was not feeling well. He quickly took his gear off and put them in a bag so we could pull it through. As I pulled a bag through the passage, he began to climb through the tomb. We didn't even get a chance to question him about what he saw before he was coming back through. He quickly swept through the squeeze in the hole and we were finally getting a look at him. He looked terrible, pale, out of breath, the dust that covers the floor of the squeeze left its mark on his face and clothes. He had numerous small cuts and scratches on his face and arms, probably from his rapid exit from the passage. His eyes were wide open. We only had a brief moment to look at the changes that had occurred to Joe before he started to head up and out of the cave without saying a word. While Joe and B started for the surface, I took a minute to gather our gear. Then I stopped to listen to the passage, and I heard nothing. And I felt nothing. The wind had stopped. Part of me wanted to get out of the cave as fast as possible, but another part of me wanted to immediately climb back through the passage to find out what made this cave tick. Then was not the time, though. I still felt a little dizzy from my injury. At that moment, I noticed B and Joe had made good time getting up on the cave passage, and I was left alone. Chills ran through my body as I scurried to catch up with them. Once we got outside the cave, I figured we would be able to find more about Joe. But when he got that final climb, he just unclipped from the rope and went straight to the truck. In the light of day, he looked even worse than in the cave. B and I gathered up the rope and our gear and headed for the truck. Joe said he did not want to stay overnight because he felt terrible. And we believed him. So we headed home. We could get no more information from Joe. He just stared straight ahead. He was shaking like a leaf. And he said he was not cold. We tried to question him. His answers were short. I asked him about if he saw the hieroglyphics. No. Did he hear us yelling? No. Did he see the round rock? No. Did he see the crystals? No. He said he just went a little ways in and started to feel sick. Something was fishy about his answers. He would have to have seen the crystals if he got far enough into the cave that he couldn't hear us yelling. But why would he not elaborate? The rest of the trip passed in eerie silence. Joe didn't say much. We gave him a brief outline of the strange events that happened in the cave, and he didn't reply. As we were dropping him off, we asked if he wanted to go back into the cave. He shook his head and ran into his house. I tried to call him the next day, and only got to his voicemail. In this journal entry, I discussed briefly the feelings B and I had at this point. I would like to elaborate on those feelings and set the mood for this part of my journal. I hope I can successfully convey our exact thoughts and feelings as we contemplated our next move. If not, I'm afraid we'll have to appear to the average readers being ignorant, naive, or downright foolish. The cave represented to us the culmination of weeks of hard work. Complete with the array of emotions, from fatigue to fear, anticipation to pain, from frustration to glory, to us we were not standing on the brink of possible destruction, but rather honoring an unspoken commitment. Much like the parent of a wayward child, we were not about to abandon our child out of fear of the unknown. Like it or not, this cave would become a part of us. And now, we must see this adventure to its fruition. Additionally, verbose explanations aside, we were being eaten alive with curiosity. Despite the overwhelming number of unexplained occurrences we experienced, we had to go back into the cave. What was making this rumbling noise? What caused a change in wind strength? Etc, etc, all the way down to Joe. What could have possibly happened to him? What did he see or experience? We had many lengthy discussions about what our next move would be, and we kept coming to the same conclusion. Return to the cave. We could offer no possible scenarios that would solve the many riddles held deep within this cave. The only way we could hope to complete the puzzle would be to conquer the cave. And we were going back to Mystery Cave. Two weeks after our trip with Joe, we were on our way back to the cave. To prepare for the trip, we contacted the local cave rescue group and got permission to borrow their low-voltage two-way phone. The phone consists of two transceivers and a long spool of thin wire. I would then be able to unwind the wires I went into the passage and stay in contact with B the entire time. We also thought it would be a good idea to take the video camera into the new passage. I purchased a case that would protect my video camera from dust as well as sharp rocks. I was more than willing to pay for the cost of the case just to make sure B got to see the entire passage. My head was doing fine, I still had a red line to mark the spot where I tried to break the rock with my head. I never went to the doctor, but it was a very painful experience. I thought about what would have happened if I had been able to go into the passage with Joe. He was a changed man after he came out. I had been calling his house nearly every day trying to talk to him, but he won't answer his phone. B called his work and a mutual friend told him that Joe called him sick two weeks ago and hasn't been in since. He said Joe warned his boss might be, he might be out for a while. I even stopped by his house twice. The first time it looked like someone was home, but no one answered the door. The second time his car was gone and there were no lights on. I hoped to talk to him before his trip but it didn't work out. As we were rigging up the ropes to descend into the cave, I felt something for the first time. I did not want to go into this cave. It was not a feeling of foreboding. 
I was not feeling some premonition. I just had no desire to enter the underground world of Mystery Cave. I didn't share this feeling with B at the time, even though I had no desire to go into the cave, I knew we had to. So I double checked my gear and slipped over the edge of the cliff. Right before the beginning, right from the beginning at least, it seemed like the cave did not want us to even be there. Every, nothing had went smoothly in the first place. Every time we tried to clip a carboner or tie a knot or attach something to the rope, we had to do it two or three times to get it right. Fortunately, we recognized and made sure everything was safe and secure. As we slowly made our way down, we were continually bumping into the sides of the cave, or stumbling as we walked, or dropping things. We finally reached a point where we stopped to gather ourselves before continuing. Our load was relatively light, but we were taking forever to get to that hole. Finally, though, we made it. We checked the camera and phone to make sure they survived the trip. We tested everything and I gathered the gear I wanted to take into the passage. Then it was time. We looked at each other, but said nothing. Then I turned to face the passage. As I twisted my body to enter the tomb, I desperately hoped that it would be the last time I would contort my body to enter this claustrophobic nightmare. The trip through Floyd's tomb went smoothly, figuratively speaking. After I got through, it took several minutes to get everything passed down to me. I got suited up and tested all the equipment. The phone worked like a charm. I videotaped the squeeze in this first section of the new passage. Since I would be unable to tape while I crawled my plan, uh was to crawl through to the next section and stop and film some more. I could video what I had just been through and then video what I was going to crawl through next. That way I could get each section from both ends. I was starting to feel pretty good about the trip. I felt a sense of per per personal satisfaction at being able to provide a way for B to see the fruits of his labor. It was awkward lugging the camera and unrolling the phone wire trying, you know, while trying to crawl. I knew it would be worth it though. The small formations were too small to show up in the video. With normal outside lighting, it would be no problem, but with my headlight as the only source of light, the effort was futile. The crystal formations turned out quite nice. They were easily large enough and made for some pretty good footage. I took advantage of the film stop to uh, check the phone. I was com It was comforting to hear someone's you know voice deep within the passage. We chatted briefly. Then I unplugged the phone and prepared to continue. The phone resembled an oversized regular phone, more like the ones you see in war movies. When I wanted to talk to B, I would just plug the phone into a special jack on the spool of wire. The phone source was on B's end of the phone, so it was always turned on. The reception was as clear as a normal phone, and I continued forward. Even though progress was slow as it was uh, steady, things were going pretty good until I reached the round rock. Once again, I got a strange feeling, just like last time. I looked around carefully, but saw nothing to be alarmed about. I proceeded to film the entire room, and I got good shots of the round rock from all angles. I got the wall, ceiling, and floor to the best of my ability. I even got some pretty good tape on the, you know, figure on the wall. It was difficult to make out exactly what was on it in the video, but you could definitely tell something was there. And after I taped everything to my satisfaction, I moved towards the end of the room to prepare, you know, to explore new territory. At the far end of the large room was a passage that led to a darkness. The entrance was about a foot lower than my head, and it looked like it continued at that height for as far back as I could see. I ducked under the ceiling and prepared to see new sights. The walls of the new passage were darker than the rest of the cave at this point. The floor was made up of the same type of broken rocks. The ceiling had the same type of near-perfect arch as in the old section of Mystery Cave. It almost seemed out of place in the jagged atmosphere of the cave. I could only see back about 30 feet or so where the passage appeared to make a right-hand turn. I thought this would be a good place to check in with B. It took a couple of beeps before he answered the phone, but once he did, his voice was still crystal clear. It sounded like he might have been snoozing. Had I been gone that long? He said he was doing fine and that I could take as much time as I needed. I thanked him and hung up. His patience has been wonderful during this whole project, by the way. He has spent a lot of time just waiting for me while I explore this passage. I was glad he was still willing to sit and wait. I hung up the phone and started to film the new passage, and then it happened. From behind me I heard the scraping noise, and it was loud. It was close. It was coming from the large room I had just left. I wheeled around to face whatever had just made that noise. When I did, I lost my presence of mind and stood up at the same time. Crunch. My helmet crashed into the passage ceiling, my light broke, and I was buried in heavy darkness. Pain shot through my neck and down into my back. The helmet had protected my head, but my neck was nearly numb from the impact. Fear enveloped me, and my knees began to weaken. I slowly and involuntarily slumped to my knees. I gently set the camera down as I began to see stars from the pain in, in my upper back. The scraping noise lasted only a second, and now the only sound I could hear was my own panic-inspired breathing. Not only could I feel the fear thick upon my chest, but the darkness seemed to hold me in place. I felt like I was vulnerable from every direction. I wanted to turn and look behind me. 
and to the side of me and in front of me. Everywhere I looked, I saw black. Finally, I broke the stupor of long terror, enough to reach for an alternate light source, the mini-mag on my helmet. I twisted the light to turn it on, and when I did, I nearly cried. I had forgot to push fresh batteries in, and now I could barely see more than a few feet. Still, it was better than nothing. I immediately began shining the light with all my might into the large room. I strained to get a glimpse of any movement of the room. Nothing. I was shaking violently as I sat there trying to figure out what to do. My mind was not thinking clearly. I honestly thought I was going to die right there in the cave. For a fleeting moment, I wondered how B would ever figure out what had happened to me, and then it hit me like a boulder. The phone! My mind must have been clearing up at that point because I was about to go through my glow sticks. Without taking my eye off the large room, I felt around in my pack for glow sticks. Since I was carrying the phone and video camera, I removed as much as possible from my pack, and one of the things I left with B was my backup headlamp. Thus I was left with only the glow sticks. I found one and ripped it out of the package. I could tell something was wrong by how it sounded. It had been inadvertently broken and now it was useless. I checked it out on the ground and searched my pack for another one. I took my eyes off the large room only to check the passage behind me occasionally. I found another glow stick, broke it to light it up, and the soft green glow created eerie colors on the walls of the cave. The stick provides barely enough light to see the immediate area and provides no hint of what lie ahead. I felt the pack for one more light. Again, without taking my eyes off the room, I felt a third glow stick and ripped it out of the package. After breaking it open to make sure it worked, I hesitated and then threw the glow stick into the large room. The throw was a perfect one, and the stick sailed through the length of the room. In the brief moment that the light traveled through, I saw nothing but cave walls. The absence of anything unusual did nothing to ease my state of panic. At the far end of the room, I got a brief glimpse of the round rock as the light bounced on it. And then the light went behind the rock and seemed to disappear. I was still shaking, but at least I didn't see anything. Still, there was the noise. I used the glow stick to light the phone, reel it with, and the fumbling fingers. I managed to plug my phone into the jack. I put the phone to my ear and heard nothing. The usual beeps to indicate connection with the other phone was not there. Terrified, I pulled the phone from the jack and reinserted it. Again, silence. The line was dead. What could have happened? I just talked to B! I found myself nearly sobbing with fear. I knew the only way out of here was back the way I came, but something was there. A third attempt at making contact with B met with the same results. I tried to think of another plan, but I could only focus on the memories of the grinding sound that I had heard. In my weakened state, I slumped against the side of the passage, breathing like I had just finished a race, never breaking eye contact with the shadows of the large room. As my shoulder touched the wall, I had felt a powerful jolt of pain remind me of my collision with the roof of the cave. Despair, agony, and terror. I can't say exactly how long I sat there, but my feet were tingling and my knees were sore. The pain in my back crept lower. Although my neck felt no different, I resolved to make an attempt to exit this evil passage. I knew if I waited too long, I would lose what little light I had. I attempted to stand, but did not have the strength. I crawled slowly to the near end of the large room, dragging my pack beside me. Using the walls of the cave, I was able to slowly stand although not straight due to my sore back. Still breathing rapidly, I slowly advanced through the room. I wound up the phone wire as I went. My eyes were staring straight ahead, straining for any sign of movements. With every step, my light would cast ever-changing shadows on the wall, keeping me busy trying to look at every one. My eyes burned as I realized I had not blinked for many minutes. How many? How long was this going on? The only sounds I could hear were the crunch of my feet on the broken rock and the wheezing of my breath. As I wound the cord, I could hear the squeak of the wheel with each turn bringing me closer to the tomb, closer to B, closer to safety. The short trip through the room took an eternity, and as I passed the crude drawing it seemed to glow, as if offering some sort of warning. I didn't know what the drawing represented, but everything about this cave seemed to instill fear. Towards the far end of the room, I could see the round rock dimly at the far reaches of my light. Something seemed different about it, but I couldn't tell what. When I got within a few feet, I could tinily tell what had changed. It had moved. That was the sound I heard. Again, terror gripped my entire body as I realized how close I was to... something. I had no choice but to continue. It wasn't easy. I inched towards the rock, holding the glow stick ahead of me in my shaking hand, using it to pierce the darkness. I stopped just this side of the rock and wound up the slack in the phone wire. Then I realized why I had lost connection with B. The rock was now sitting on the wire. I gave it a tug and the thin wire snapped. 
My only hope of contact with the outside world ceased to exist when that wire broke. I had never felt so alone and helpless, buried deep within the earth. I had voluntarily descended into my own grave, with a casket of solid rock. With the phone now useless, I set it down in the passage. My gaze fixed on the round rock, I proceeded forward. My breathing was rapid, with my throat dry and aching and my mouth dusty. With every crunch of the rock below my feet, my heart seemed to stop. No movement could be seen in the green glow of my stick. I got to the rock and peered over the top. Seeing nothing, I took several rapid steps past it. When I reached the other side, I recoiled in horror at what I saw. In the side of the passage near the, hole, near the floor was a hole, with another passage revealed. It had been covered by the rock. But now it was exposed. The rock could not have moved by itself. I backed away from the hole and collided with the opposite wall. I had not been paying attention to the pain in my back, but now it came back to me in all its fury. I stared down at the newly discovered passage. It went down at a 45 degree angle and continued straight for as far as I could see. Several feet down I could see the glow stick that I had thrown. It illuminated the passage enough that I could tell the walls were very smooth. The floor seemed to be the same way, unlike the rest of the cave. The passage was about three feet in diameter as far as I could see. It would have been an easy passage to explore if I had the least desire to do so. Right now I wanted out of the cave and into daylight. I slowly backed away from the hole towards B. I never took my eyes off the abyss. I nearly tripped over the phone wire as I turned to leave the devil's lair. I noticed my mini mag was practically dead, leaving me only with the glow stick. I wanted to sprint to Floyd's tomb. Just hearing another human being would be would help alleviate some of the fear I was experiencing. As I turned away from the large rock and the hole, I felt an overwhelming sense of panic fill my soul. It felt like a legion of demons was about to attack me from behind. I felt like my salvation lie ahead of me in the darkness and Lucifer was behind me, trying to keep me from safety. I found myself moving much faster than I should have been in that cave. My only thought was to get out as quickly as possible. I passed the crystal formation, barely even noticing this beautiful creation of nature in the green glow of my light. Every time I ducked to avoid a rock, I felt like my back was screaming its reminder of my injury. When I got to the point in the passage where I had to crawl, I flung myself down on all fours, barely slowing down as I stopped. When my hands came in contact with the cave floor, I felt an electric shock shoot all the way down my back and simultaneously my arms. For the first time since this nightmare had begun, I let out a scream. I crumpled down and lay there on the rock with new levels of pain manifesting every time I inhaled. Whimpering from fear and pain, I tried to listen to any other noise in the cave. I could feel the silence pounding in my head. I knew from previous trips that B was still out of earshot, but I was close. Forcing myself... To move, I winced as I pulled my body on all fours and started to progress through the cave. I still held a glow stick in my hand, but I had ceased checking behind me. Now my focus was ahead of me. I reached the point where I could yell to be, but I didn't make a sound. I didn't want to stop long enough to talk. Finally, I reached the last stretch of the cave before the squeeze. As I was crawling towards the beginning of the tomb, I called to B and he answered back. I screamed to him to get everything ready to go. He asked if I was okay, since he hadn't heard from me on the phone, he had gotten worried. I told him no. And to get everything ready to go, when I reached the rope, I flipped off my helmet and shoved it into my pack. For the first time, I realized I had forgot the video camera. It was a fleeting thought. I cared no more about the camera than a passenger of the Titanic cared about a hat or a coat. I tied the pack to the rope and told him to pull it through. Then I told him to start heading towards the surface as soon as he pulled the rope, though. He asked why, and I screamed that there was something in the cave with us. My back ached with every move I made. I knew it didn't matter, though. I was going to get through the tomb as fast as I could, injuries notwithstanding. Just as I started into the squeeze, I felt the wind of the passage increase. And with it, the most nauseating stench I had ever experienced. It smelled like damp, rotting, rancid, putrid death. I almost started to dry heave. I pulled my shirt up and over my nose to shield me from the overpowering smell. At this point, B smelled it too. He yelled, what is that? Then he yelled at me to hurry up and get through. I told him I was coming. Then I took a deep breath through my shirt and started back through. B's yelling had intensified my fear and panic, as if I needed any help. I knew he could sense the urgency in getting out of the place. Still, as I worked my way through, I yelled at him to start up, that I would catch up with him when I got through. He said he would. He placed my glow stick inside the passage and began to climb out. This time through the squeeze, though, I had no regard for the tightness of the passage. I was scraping my face, ears, arms, and shoulders. Every inch of the squeeze meant numerous scratches on my body, but I barely even noticed them. My back was nearly paralyzing me with pain. Once again, I felt like 
I felt the rising need to vomit because of the odor being delivered to my nostrils by this breeze. Halfway through Floyd's tomb, I took a break to catch my breath. I was approaching exhaustion from my respiration rate was through the roof. The top of the passage seemed to rest my cheek, and the floor felt like broken glass on my opposite cheek. As I paused briefly to recuperate, I heard the scraping noise coming from deep within the cave. It continued for several seconds in silence. I let out a cry, which startled me. I was no longer consciously reacting to the noise. The cry was a subconscious response to the fear which flowed through my entire body. In a panic, I began to screw through the passage. As I reached the largest part of the tomb, I quickly slid my arms under my body to get into position to exit through our hole. I grabbed the rope and pulled with all my might. When my shoulders reached the hole, they lodged, and I was stuck. I dug my feet into the rocks and wriggled my way through the passage. Then I turned my body slightly and tried again. This time, I was successful in pulling my upper body through. Though I, would no though I would carefully work my way out, since there is a three-foot drop on the outside of the hole, this time I kicked my legs, pulled, mo pulled in my arms, and plop, dropped out of the tomb right onto my shoulder. I tried to roll out to soften the impact, but was unable to do anything more than take the blow. Strangely, the pain was focused on my shoulder, apparently not affecting my already sore back. I rolled onto all fours and slowly rose to my feet. The smell was much less intense outside that passage. I grabbed the glow stick and used it to find my helmet. I began to head for the webbing to climb up while strapping on my helmet. When I got to the webbing, I reached up to grab hold and recoiled in horror. The glow of the glow stick, I could see for the first time the injuries to my arms. They were covered in deep cuts and scrapes. Much of my arm was covered in blood. The wounds were not deep enough to bleed freely, but rather ooze. In that brief moment that I had stopped, I noticed that there was a silence in the cave. No sounds from the passage and nothing from up ahead. Once again, the feeling of being alone returned, motivating me to proceed. Climbing up to the little drop-off proved to be difficult in my condition. Having the glow stick as the only light source added to the challenge. Once on top, I scrambled to catch up with B. I was impressed with the speed of his ascent. Although I did not mention any more of my physical condition during my exit, I was hurting. With every step, I took pain shot through my lower back and my neck. My arms were shredded and my shoulder had a nice gash in it. I honestly believe that were it not for the terror I felt at the time, I would not have the energy and the motivation to climb out. I was running on pure adrenaline. Unfortunately, it was about to end. I did not see or hear B until I reached the small area at the bottom of the drop. He was on rope and climbing out as fast as he could. I could hear him moving quickly and breathing heavily. I called out to him and his startled reaction told me he was nearly as tense as I was. He told me to get on rope and start climbing. We both knew that would be dangerous and not something we would normally ever do. But this was different. I stood there looking up at where the rope disappeared into the darkness above me. It danced around as B made his way to safety. He was out of sight, but I knew he was done. I knew the rope was my lifeline to the outside. To light, safety, behind me was darkness, fear, the unknown. I had the fleeting thought of a movie scene where the actor had outwitted the monster and had reached the front door of the haunted house, and just as he reaches for the knob, he hears a sound behind him and turns only to see. I slid the glow stick into the cord on my helmet and reached for my harness. Then I thought I would let B, you know, get a little bit higher when I pulled the rope up that was stretched down into the cave. That would make it easier to get out once we got to the top of the drop. I chose not to wind the rope around my arm since it was sore and bleeding. So I just pulled it into a pile on the floor. From above, I heard B warn me, rock, and I ducked under the ledge as several small rocks landed on the floor near my feet. I quickly went back to pulling the rope in. I had about half of it in, about 50 feet, when the rope sna hit a snag. It was a solid. There was no way I was going to crawl back in to release it, so I just decided to forget the rope and get my harness on and get out of the cave. I quickly threw the harness around me and started to buckle it. Before I could secure it, I heard a strange noise at my feet. My pulse began to quicken. I looked down at the rope, only to discover to my horror that the rope was disappearing into the darkness. Something was pulling the rope back into the caves. I let go of the harness and began to clawing my way up the rope. The unbuckled harness fell to the floor. Fortunately, I held onto an ascender. At the moment, I could not think straight and began climbing out of the cave without being attached to the rope. I climbed out many times without using an ascending device, but it, I was always attached to the rope just in case. I was climbing as fast as my battered body could haul me up. I was in a near panic state again and consequently was scraping, bumping, and gouging my arms and legs. As I climbed, I screamed to B that something was pulling the rope. He yelled back to hurry up. Luck was with me in that I didn't slip and fall back into that hole. I caught up to B on the ledge below where our rebelay point was fixed. I told him to keep going. I would only take him a few minutes, and uh, but every second would be torture, because I'd have to wait for him to get up. I watched the rope that we had just uh, 
you know, climbed up. I expect to see some creature from deep within the earth climb up and make me its lunch. The rope moved around a bit, in rhythm with B's climbing, but did not appear to have any tension on it. As I stood there, waiting for B, I kept watching the rope for signs of anything bizarre. I didn't know if my heart could take any more stress, and I could not have been more wired. I tried to relax a bit to make sure I was thinking rationally, but my poor brain had reached sensory overload. As B reached the top of the glass climb, I got ready to clip onto my ascender and get my sorry ass out of there. It was then that I noticed that the rope began to tighten from below, and I could feel the tension on the rope. But it was a steady tension, not like someone was climbing up. Either way, I wanted out of there as fast as possible. I clipped on and scrambled up the rope. I had noticed, but B had kept moving on towards the entrance. I got up the last few feet in a hurry. I just unclipped and kept on moving, leaping the rope behind. By the time I got to the entrance of the cave in daylight, B was almost up where the rope was anchored. I wanted to get up so bad I almost started to free climb without climbing onto the rope. I could see B was almost up, so I clipped on and started up. I almost didn't make it up. I had just started up when I nearly collapsed from exhaustion. I managed to recover enough to pull myself up the last few feet. As I climbed, I could hear the tension on the rope manifest itself by the stretching noise in the rope. I prayed the rope would not break with me attached to it. The second that I reached the top, I unclipped the ascender. I could see B kneeling down from the tree. So I limped over to him and collapsed. For the first time since I went through Floyd's tomb, we could see each other. We just stared. I knew it looked pretty bad. But I didn't know that B was in such a bad shape. He had cuts and scrapes on every exposed surface of his body. His face was pale, almost white. His mouth and his eyes were wide open. He was breathing heavily, almost gasping. The shock we shared at the other person's appearance was broken. When we heard the rope around the tree stretch and the knot B had tightened. I was frozen in place, overwhelmed with fright. B seemed to be transfixed on the knot. Then in one motion he produced a pocket knife and began to work on the rope. It is amazing how a person's state of mind can alter the perception of time. I'm sure it only took about four or five seconds to sever the rope from the tree, but it seemed like an hour. When the rope was cut, the knot fell to the ground. While the end of the rope zipped across the rocks and over the edge to the cliff, the speed of it causing a humming noise as it went. As, 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 as soon as the rope was cut, B let out a cry. He dropped the knife and fell backwards. Watching the rope fly over the edge brought the feelings in the passage back to me. I got up and headed towards the truck. I noticed B was still laying there, wide-eyed, staring at the point the rope disappeared. I called to him, which seemed to break his trance. He got up and hurried away from the tree, the cave, the nightmare. Neither of us said a word on the way home. It's now four days after our trip. It's taken me four days and dozens of attempts to get this entire experience written into the journal. Every time I started to write, I recalled the terrible feelings I had and couldn't write anymore. I felt compelled to continue so as to document the unbelievable events, while all the details were still fresh in my mind. I can still feel the pain, still smell the stench, still experience the terror. Even typing for my journal has taken hours. I would like to write more, but I will have to wait, even now with several days between me and the event. I can't relax. I can barely concentrate. It's all for now. It's been three weeks since our last visit to the cave. I want to update everyone on my condition, my plans for the cave, and the events of the past few weeks. I apologize for not returning your phone calls. I've been getting all the uh, all of your messages. I just haven't felt up to calling back. Stephen, Mark, thanks for your words of encouragement on my answering machine. I know you two are sincerely concerned for me. You're awesome friends. Mark, I know you stopped by my house a few times. I'm sorry I never answered the door. It really helped me just knowing that you dropped by. Sis, I can hear worry in your voice. I'm okay, don't worry about me. Just take care of those nieces and nephews of mine. I figure if I can get this site updated, I'll let everyone know at once what how I'm, how I'm doing at all. A lot has happened in the last three weeks, so I'll do my best to cover everything. I guess I should start in the last entry. It took several days to get the last you know journal entry written down. I was so shaken up from the experience that I could do little else but sit around and ponder what had happened. Right now, I'm on long-term medical leave from work. I tried to go to work several days after the event, but my boss sent me home. I couldn't concentrate, and I looked terrible. I had been to the doctor, but I couldn't tell him about the experience. So I, so I just told him I'm under a lot of stress. He recommended rest and gave me a prescription to help me relax. <laughs> Good drugs. When we left the cave, I was nearly in a state of shock. I could not think clearly and was having a difficult time trying to understand what had happened. I didn't eat much, nor did I get any sleep. I was glad in the, I had the presence of mind to write down my experience while it was fresh in my mind. As I reread what I had wrote, I feel like I accurately portrayed what happened in the cave that day. I wouldn't change anything I wrote, even though it took three days to write it. When I finished writing in my journal, I felt much better. I guess it's kind of therapeutic. Unfortunately, it didn't last. In fact, it was after then that things got really bad. B and I parted company after the trip, and I didn't see him again till yesterday. 
I didn't try to reach him, and he didn't try to get a hold of me either. Nor did either of us even try to contact Joe. B just dropped me off after the trip, and I spent the next several days by myself in my house. I, had, I tried to eat, but I had no appetite. I was restless. I couldn't find anything to do to take my mind off the experience. That's when I determined that I should write it down. As I mentioned, that helped me think a little clearer, and it seemed to be a little calmer. But I didn't think... But it didn't last. That's, that's the whole problem. I went to work the next day, but was sent home. The day after that, I had an overwhelming feeling of anxiety sink into my soul. I was depressed and confused. I had no one to turn to for comfort. I was getting all kinds of phone calls from people, but I just let the answering machine take the calls. I even changed the message on the machine to let everyone know I was alright. I continued in this miserable state, eating and sleeping whenever I could manage until a week after the trip. Then things started to get strange. At first I was hearing sounds in the house that had no explanation. Footsteps, shutting noises, creaking doors, you know, the typical horror movie cliches. Only the sounds were not distinct. It was as though I wasn't sure I heard what I thought I heard. I would be eating or getting out of the shower and stop, thinking I heard something, but the sound would not repeat itself. In fact, if it weren't for the fact that it happened frequently, I couldn't be sure that there was noises in the first place. Either way, I was scared. It was as though I had been caught in a spider web for the last week's feeling of anxiety, foreboding, tension filled my life. Then came the hallucinations. I began seeing things in a manner similar to the sounds I was hearing, just a glimpse of something in the corner of my eye when I would turn to look. Nothing. I had been sleeping with the lights on in my room, but now I kept all the lights in the house on from before dusk after dawn. When I started to see things on a regular basis, I purchased a gun. Got it from an ad in the paper so I wouldn't have to wait for a permit. I went to the doctor but didn't mention the details of my life. Just told him I couldn't relax and I walked out there with a prescription. Fortunately, my wounds and injuries were pretty much healed by this time. My back still hurt a little, but the prescription took care of that, too. When I was on the medication, I felt great. I didn't want to walk around high the rest of my life, though. So I would only need to take it at the end of the tough day. Unfortunately, the severity of the sightings increased, giving rise to the need of the medication. The flashes in the corner of my eyes continued, but then I began to see shapes and shadows. They would be outside my windows, usually at night, and I couldn't make out anything solid. It was so hard to pin down what I was seeing. Soon I began to close all my drapes and blinds so I could remove the possibilities of seeing something. Doing so did help in that respect, but my life was still a mess. My daily routine was mechanical and empty. I would sleep in as long as I could, usually out of exhaustion. Then I would get up clean and try to eat something. I'd lost a lot of weight, so I tried to get as much, you know, possible down me. Then I'd exercise a little, nap a lot, and I'd only been out of the house a few times in the last two weeks. The store, the doctor, the gun purchase... I didn't watch much TV because I couldn't concentrate. I spent a lot of my time on the internet, and I was doing research on caves and cave myths. The only story I could find was cave folklore about the Hodag. Hodag's a creature that, you know, supposedly roams caves. Two weeks after we went in, you know, a week after I began hearing things, I began to have nightmares. Extremely lucid nightmares, no specific theme or recurring events, just plain terrifying. Sometimes I was in my house and someone was trying to get me. Only I couldn't run because I had no legs, or the times I was in a vat and someone was pouring a syrup-like liquid on me, filling the vat. I would wake up with a, with a panic. I would stay awake until exhaustion forced me to enter dreamland once again, a brutal routine. It continued for several days until I reached a climax on the sixth day, which was yesterday, by the way. My dreams seemed so real that I had a hard time telling if I was awake or not. I was beat, really drained, of energy and spirit. I was going from my living room to my bedroom in the early evening when I looked down the hall and saw a dark figure towards the end. I thought it was a thief and began to back up slowly. It didn't move, and as I was backing up, the lights flickered off and on. Every muscle was tense. I stopped to stare at the figure, and then the phone rang. It startled me so bad I stumbled over the chair. When I got up, I wheeled around to look at the hall, and nothing was there. I grabbed my keys and left the house. I felt compelled to get in the car and drive. My pulse pounded in my temp temples as I got in and started the car. I wanted to drive to the Overlook Point to see the city lights. I didn't know why I needed to go there, I just knew I had to. The closer I got, the more urgent the feeling. When I arrived to the point, I saw something that at first startled me, but then caused me to be more relaxed than I'd been in a long time. Joe was there. He was out of his car, standing looking at the lights. We looked at each other. I could see the tired look on his face as he'd been going through the same miserable trial that I'd been experiencing. He could tell from the look on my face that we shared the same experience. Our conversation was unbelievably brief. You been back? He began, even though he knew the answer. Yeah. We need to return. Tomorrow good? Yeah. Noon. He got in his car and I got into mine. 
I hadn't even wanted to talk to him about the experience. Obviously, he didn't want to know mine. I drove over to B's house. When I answered the door and I thought that B actually looked like he was doing fine, somewhat happy, one look at me and his disposition changed. Our conversation was also succinct. I ran into Joe, and we're going back tomorrow at noon. B looked dead serious. He just nodded his head. I asked him if I could spend the night at his house. He eagerly let me in. I didn't notice until later, but every light in the house was turned on. He led me to his spare room. Help yourself. Thanks. I washed up in the bathroom, took some medication, and got the first decent sleep in a long time. I awoke early this morning and came home to ready for the trip. I thought I would send out this update so no one would, you know, be wondering what's going on with me. I suspect by the time most of you read this, I'll be back home, and we'll have a great story to tell. I promise if you haven't heard from me by now, you will very shortly. It's now 10 a.m. on Saturday the 19th. You'll be leaving. We'll be leaving for the cave in two hours. Preparing with a trip will be like no other trip I've been on. For the first time in my life, I will carry a gun into the cave. I will also carry a knife, an extensive first aid kit, plenty of food and water, and a camera. I'll take several sources of light and a pad of paper and pencil. I will have to take all of my climbing rope since B lost his in the cave. I'll carry a good length of rope with me on the other side of Floyd's tomb. This is the first time in three weeks that I've heard any reference to Floyd's tomb. It's in shivers of my spine just typing it. There are so many things I hope to accomplish this day, so many answers I hope to find in a tiny passage hidden from view. Reflecting on the events leading up to today leaves me feeling dizzy. Was this all a bad dream? Unfortunately, I'm wide awake, and still in a few short hours, I might face my nightmares. The thought of having another person with me in the passage does nothing to alleviate the fear I feel. I almost chuckle as I ponder a childish notion that we will have to consider who's entering the tomb first, who will lead the way into the dark unknown? Who will decide when to turn back? Foremost among the questions in my mind is, what about the video camera that I left behind? It is supposed to be able to record in complete darkness. I left the thing running, so what might be fine on the tape? Darker questions follow. What if the camera's gone? What if it's destroyed? Although it's difficult to put an exact name on my motivation, I think closure fits quite nicely. I need to find a few things out about the cave. The main thing, believe it or not, is to find the end of the cave. With all the bizarre things I have witnessed these past few weeks, it would seem a bit trite to want as a primary goal to get to the end. But that is what I want. To be sure, I will be seeking other bits of knowledge along the way. If, however, I find the end to the main passage, and an end to the passage hidden by the rock, I will be content to never return to the passage or the cave again. Never. It would seem to me that crawling headfirst through the tight passage into the darkness isn't a natural thing, just like crawling up the sides of a cliff for recreation, or jumping out of a perfectly good airplane and floating to the ground. We do these things to satisfy our hunger for adventure, the subconscious desire to conquer our own little Everest. As B is fond of saying, caving is the last opportunity for exploration, for the person with modest means. True, just a short drive from just about anywhere in the country is a cave waiting to be explored. Even a cave well known among the general public can be approached by someone for the first time as an adventure, something new, something to overcome. Because it's there. Most of you don't agree with my decision to pursue the cave. I know this from the messages I've received. I'm afraid I don't have a choice. If I'm ever to experience restful slumber, I must return. If I'm ever to walk the halls of my own home in peace, I have to return. If I'm ever to exit the overworld and enter the subterranean world of a cave, I must now return. I no longer feel that I have a choice. I must return. For my family and friends who are reading this, be at peace. I'm going to conquer it. And then I'll return and update this website immediately. I'll include any photo we take in the cave today, and if you stop by the house, I will show you the video I have. I expect to be home later tonight, or tomorrow the latest, I don't know. See you all soon. With a lot of answers... Love, Ted. Well, that's where it ends. No, I'm serious. It's, uh, it's a cliffhanger. It leaves us to uh, make what really happened up in our heads. I mean, we have to decide what really happened to Ted, Joe, and B. I mean, did they end up living or did they end up dying? I don't know. What do I think? Again, I have no idea. I, I think they might be dead or missing or maybe too lazy to actually update the page or too scared that they went off and started their own lives or something. Most likely dead or something, because you, you think they'd update this page at least. But now, what did I think of the story as a whole? I mean, it was long. It was feature length. Honestly, it was hectic, and all the reactions in the story were real, and I actually really got enthralled into it all, too. You know, I learned about, you know, not just the whole process of caving, but then, you know, once we got through that first episode, as soon as things started happening in here, I was genuinely intrigued to see what happened after I saw the hieroglyphics. And then I started to, you know, 
wonder what was going on. It felt very Blair Witch Project-y, you know, and that's not a bad thing because the the story really didn't give us a whole lot of descriptors on what we were running away from, you know. It just, it basically just told us something was following us, so we had to make this up in our head. I mean, I honestly pictured, like, this fucking wolf-like creature running after you the whole time, and that, and, you know, to honestly leave the imagination up to the uh, reader themselves was a great touch, you know, it works, because it's not like they're giving us not a whole lot of content to work with versus a whole lot, you know, we kind of, we, it's, we're given the sort of Mad Libs-esque moment where it's, it's strongly curated for us to pick certain things, and it works, it gives us the fear, instead of, you know, telling us that it's a demon chasing you or whatnot, we have to think, could it be a demon, could it be an animal, could it be anything, it, it honestly works, and to give us this element of you know, fear that we have to fill in ourselves alongside the story that genuinely keeps us going because, you know, we're alongside Ted. We feel the same way as Ted, too. We're genuinely scared as well. Even the process of going through the caves, when you take the time to think about it, you know, when, when you're in, the, when you're in the, you know, Floyd's, you know, tomb, at any moment when the earth changes, you could be squashed and crushed and dead. I mean, that's a genuine fear right there. And if you have claustrophobia, dude, this must be like 10 times worse for you to hear. Overall, I think it was actually really good. Uh, there were parts, you know, when we got to the household at the end and Ted's events were a little more paranormal for the whole style of the story. It still somewhat worked. It was good. And overall, I did enjoy it. Now, the cliffhanger ending, you know, I'm not a big fan of them, but over here it did work. You know, we do fill in the blanks and we sort of, you know, develop our own ending as time goes on. I don't want to be that guy, but before I finish the episode at all, I actually have to tell you about stuff outside the creepypasta. Truth be told, this is actually very similar to another story you can find online known as The Fear of Darkness by Thomas Lara. And if you want an ending to this story, you should go check that one out. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because those two stories are actually very identical. Um, the only thing I've really noticed different is, like, the names and how the story is structured in a way, like, you know, where things come back and forth, uh, you know, where certain chapters are placed. Um, there's a whole bunch of copyright dates thrown out. Nobody really knows who exactly did it first. I'm going to say Ted, most likely. The other one has, like, a copyright date in 1987, which seems kind of weird, but I don't know who wrote it first. I really have no idea. Uh, I'm just here to read a story, to be honest. I'm here to get spooked, so I didn't really look too much into that. Um, if anybody, you know, wants to find the answer, please let us know in the comments below if you find it and, you know, if you ascertain what it really could be. Now, looking at cave myths such as the Hodag, which is mentioned in this creepypasta, it's actually a folklore myth from Wisconsin, where one Eugene Shepard in 1893 actually captured one. But it turned out Eugene Shepard was actually a prankster, and this was a prank as well. So, you can kind of disregard that. Um, the hodag itself, I believe, is just a uh, general symbol, like the actual animal itself, of Wisconsin and whatnot, so that's pretty cool. Mystery Cave actually is known to be Gypsum Passage, located under an interstate road, which does account for all the rumbling. In fact, here's a picture that I found on Reddit of somebody actually finding the area. They have a whole gun pointed down there with a flashlight, so, you know, they're, they're obviously going to be set for anything that shows up. In fact, it kind of seems like the whole uh, Tet situation, right? I mean, he did bring a gun with him as well. All in all, though, I have to say Ted the Caver is a great creepypasta. I do actually really enjoy it, and I would recommend you all to go check it out. I know it's long as heck, but, you know, still, you know, go, go check it out. It might be worth a read here and down, uh, you know, as time goes on. It's definitely a good creepypasta. It is one of my favorites. It is lengthy. Um, there were times where it was, uh, you know, just full of detail that I honestly felt was not needed, but overall it was a great piece. Uh, and that being said, that is a finale to our Haunted Gaming <laughs> mini-series, I guess. Um, not really Haunted Gaming anyways, you know, it's just in that bracket. It's a creepypasta, it's a little creepypasta series. Uh, you know, we finished another long one. And, uh, if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, dislike it if you dislike it. Tell me in the comments below what you thought of it. What would you rate it? What would you change? And what do you think happened to Ted? In fact, let me, let me know what you think happened in the ending. This is me, Mudahar, and I am out.